Okay, good. So barring any questions, and it sounds like there are a few. Dylan, 34 year old female, moderate right-sided neck pain and pain into the arm. What do you think are the most typical dip differential diagnoses for this patient? Um, cervical radiculopathy is one of them comes to mind. Okay, what else? Give us, let's go through two of them. Um, could have ro rotator cuff pathology. Okay. So we have right-sided neck pain with pain into the arm. Uh, which one do you think would be your first one? Radiculopathy is my first thought. Okay. So if you Recording said questions, it. What, what questions would, would kind of lend you to think that, that would strengthen us for radiculopathy? So if you're thinking in the four question model, which ones would be the best to kind of rule in or rule out radiculopathy? Quality of pain is the first one that comes to mind. I want to know what it feels like. You know, is it, is it that somatic pain versus um, neurological tissue? Mm -hmm. That's probably yeah, like a hallmark question I would ask right away to kind of strengthen one or strengthen the other. I think it is, and that's where you look at the quality of the pain. You know, is it neural, is it referral, referred or somatic versus kind of radicular in nature? So what would this patient look like if they had radicular pain? What kind of pain is it? More of that like numbness and tingling type of pain. It could be that, you know, lancellating pain Jim loves to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, a lightning bolt, the kind of shooting sharp. Your pain. So and what if you what other type of pain, what would somatic pain look like? Dull achy is the buzz term that comes to mind for me. You know, if I hear that it's kind of generalized, it's more that dull achy. It's not, you know, mm -hmm. sharp stopping them in their tracks. It's just kind of there. Yeah. Because with that one, like your your two differentials are pretty far apart between like the shoulder and like a rotator cuff and that. So yeah, okay. What other questions will you face? So this person says, okay, you know, no, I don't have pain down to my hand. My pain goes down to my elbow. This individual, dull and achy, kind of in the shoulder maybe down as far as the elbow, but not there right now. I'm, I'm thinking it's more of that, you know, there's a tendon or muscle issue going on and we're getting referred pain rather than radicular pain. Yeah, that's perfect. Like with this one, you can then change your differential. So like here you're thinking, okay, well, I don't have radicular pain. So you're changing your, uh, your H1 to shoulder pain? I would to the, yeah, around the shoulder or, you know, it could be, it still could be cervical involvement with it, but um okay. most commonly i would say i see a lot of shoulders so when you have that mm -hmm. referral on the side of the arm when it's okay. all achy so how would you tease this individual out as far as shoulder pain so now you're in the shoulder differentials what what are the likely shoulder differentials do you think you'd have with this individual rotator cuff pathology um mm -hmm. labral pathology mm. yeah yeah you want it to be things that you can test and that's the key is that you don't want to, you know you start picking pathologies you can't test it's of little value to you. So both of those you can you can you can test for it and differentiate. So now you're on to different questions. What questions would you look for in this individual to isolate? Which one do you want to pick? Rotator cuff? Want to pick labrum? Pick rotator cuff. Okay. I would ask them when they get the pain. Mm -hmm. You know, are they getting the pain when they're moving their arm in specific motions, or is there any motions they can't do without becoming painful? Okay. And what would that look like? What do you think the rotator cuff would then look like? I think they would have pain with rotation or elevation or combination of both of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe pain location. I mean, you know, that could be just, you can name anywhere and be correct, essentially. But what would you call it? Pick a spot. Pick, what do you mean specifically a spot? Like pick a motion or pick pick a muscle? Yeah, pick a motion. What motion is painful? To elevation. Okay. Overhead. And, and where, where do you typically see their pain occur? Where may it occur in this individual? Lateral arm, lateral, yeah, arm. lateral arm. Is there, you know, this person could have a painful arc of motion in one case. It could be more end range. So let's go with this. Let's say your patient has, has more end range pain. Let's say toward the last 20 degrees of shoulder motion. It reproduces their pain in the overhead position. Okay, now you question them and say, okay, yeah, they also have it at nighttime. So what other things would you do to then strengthen your diagnosis? So far you have lateral arm pain, they have shoulder pain. So, you know, you used your, you know, basically used one question to kind of figure that Well, you used two questions. You ruled out radicular pain. So you changed your H1 to shoulder pain. And then you could ask what other question would be a good one 
even before you did a test to kind of strengthen the idea of shoulder pain. How long the pain last? Mm -hmm. Kind of looking for does the pain go away when they stop that motion that's painful? Yeah. But Frank, you can, you can ask a friend. Frank's your friend today. So this person has shoulder pain and you're trying to rule out. First, you're thinking, okay, is it cervical or is it shoulder? Now you're kind of thinking shoulder or, or let's say rotator cuff. What the questions would you think would, would you use? You think, okay, would strengthen your hypothesis for rotator cuff? Well, they're, they're pretty young, right? 34 years old. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily think degenerative. So in that case, I would ask about, you know, was there an injury that, that caused it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're looking for a clear mechanism, which helps. Right. So yeah, so he's 34 and he has a, a five-year-old son and he was out there throwing baseballs to him. So he threw about hundred baseballs to him for an hour. Woke up the next day with, with, with shoulder pain. Okay. He was throwing overhead. We'll put it that way. And he has pain in the last 20 degrees of the range of motion, let's say. So, you know, where is that different as far as like a painful arc would be? So usually a painful arc is going to be more in that, like, you know, 80 or 90 up to like 110 or so that, mm -hmm. that, that middle zone as opposed to the end range. Yeah. So it doesn't really mm -hmm. fit with the painful arc. Uh, yeah. It might be more of a, you know, we can get back into the thoracic stuff where maybe as he's rotating up, something isn't moving in the thoracic spine, the scapula isn't up the rotating and you get some, some, you know, call it what you want, impingement or some, or some issues mm -hmm. at the end. Yeah. Then. That's exactly why I made that range, that higher range. Because at that point, you'd probably be, you know, what you're hoping for is that you can look at the clavicle and scapula. That last bit of elevation is associated with a posterior roll of the clavicle, which we'll get into in later modules. But I know we touched about it in the cervical module. We also have the upper rotation of the scapula. And, and Dylan, what does the thoracic spine need to do at that upper end range? It rotate, right? We get 10 degrees of our, our cervical rotation. So... Um, mm -hmm. the upper, the, you know, we need the ribs to kind of be moving with us as we're moving and, you know, vertebrae got to be able to rotate. So specifically the, say the right handed, the right ribs need to kind of, um, they're going to go ahead and they're going to go anterior medial, posteriorly roll. Left's going to do the opposite. Um, mm -hmm. Vertebrae's got to be able to rotate as well. So they're, they're going to need extension. And that's probably the biggest thing yes. I see people lack is with that overhead is not getting the extension in that upper big their back or yeah to get out of the way yeah that's kind of what you see is that they'll lack that extension so they'll take it from the glenohumeral joint to try and finish the range of motion so they'll get that excessive motion in the shoulder joint in this individual so i'm not going to go too deep into detail with it i think that's pretty good just in the thought process as you see as we go through it and again keep in mind too this is basically the same format we use in like an oral practical you know I feed a gone with radiculopathy or referred pain in the neck and picked a segmental dysfunction. I may have gone in a, in a cervical way. I may bring them back to the cervical and take away the, the, the shoulder and give them negative shoulder tests. But the shoulder was a little different and I thought we could tie it in the thoracic spine. So you kind of go with this. So just to give you an idea, you know, this is kind of generally how the oral practical also flows and also kind of the, the thought process that would occur where this person may start, start off as a neck and shoulder pain patient. They flow into a shoulder, but then it flows back into a thoracic spine eval. To look at these different things. That's what's fun about these courses. Once you get cervical, lumbar, and thoracic, you're gonna have a ton of information to go from. Cool. So Frank, let's keep it at 34 year old female, moderate right sided neck pain, with pain into the upper thoracic spine. Let's say about the level of T4. Okay. What differentials do you think we'd have there? Uh, so you could have. Um, I kind of break it down into first a cervical thing. So uh, you can have a skeletal dysfunction in the cervical spine. Um, mm -hmm. You could have some, some, it could be a local thoracic spine issue where, um, you know, something, you know, uh, facet joint is, is restricted segmental dysfunction. Um, uh, yeah, so for, for if, if you want to, that, those are probably the, my top two. Okay, so you're thinking either cervical referral or segmental in thoracic spine? Yeah. Yeah, those, those would be my top two. So let's start with cervical. How could we, again, with a couple of questions, rule in or out cervical spine? Um, I would say, um, yeah, or strength or weaken, let's say. Yeah, it's not really a question. This is, this is more of a getting into the test, but um, mm -hmm. you know, asking if, if neck motions reproduce the yeah. pain in the thoracic spine. Yep. 
you know, um, now th- there certainly are, you know, T4 is maybe a little bit low, but like the upper thoracic, mm-hmm. you need that for rotation anyway. So it might just be that, Hey, an upper, you know, T1 or T2 restriction is still going to be get angered with cervical rotation, even though it's not a cervical issue, but, uh, I'd probably start there. Yeah. Which one. Okay. So now I think about that. What would be your next likely differential? So let's say you're comfortable with your questions that this is a segmental dysfunction. You, and so you've asked them, okay, what's your pain level? The pain level should be moderate compared to a disc. Yeah. So I have your pain level. What, what things provoke it? Is it, oh, it's, you know, right rotation. If I rotate to the right and I look at the ceiling, okay, I get a reproduction of symptoms. Or is it when I look at the floor, you know, either one can reproduce that, that T4 pain pattern. So is it with neck motion, you know, exclusive? Now it could still be thoracic. But what I would also look for is local pain. You know, is there local pain there as well? Any other questions anyone else has? Please say them out loud because I can't even see the chat on my computer. Oh, let me get my other one. Dueling computers here. The other questions would be would what questions? Oh, go ahead. Have to describe the pain if they're feeling. Is it more of a sharp pain? Is it more, you know, dull, achy? Can they point to it or is it more general? Have them explain their pain. Yeah. Yeah, that would kind of help too. Is, is, it, is it focal with movement there? You know, in your special test, you know, one of the gym, gym always will talk about is, is looking at, you know, okay, palpation as being sensitive. You know, with the cervical spine, you know, one of your tests is probably going to be PAs or palpation. You're like, okay, is it painful? at the segment that I'm looking at. And not necessarily looking at that point at the, at the pavum to say, okay, is it restricted or is it hypermobile? Looking, do I have a dysfunctional segment either at T4 or at, let's call that one probably T5-ish. They refer down the Cloward's areas. Do I have a painful segment that's there? So there your special test might be palpation and then PAs, mobilization. You can also look at active range of motion. When they do active range of motion, you know, where is the pain? Is there a limitation or something in the cervical spine versus is it purely at the thoracic spine when they get to late flexion? Because if they do cranial vertebral flexion, they should be okay. It should be in the latter half of flexion when they roll into the thoracic spine with my, with my test that I would see that pain or is it an extension? Maybe they don't get it, but maybe they're getting that anterior shear moment in the middle of the neck. I think both groups we looked at that anterior shear where the ear kind of centers over the shoulder it doesn't go posterior to the ear. So they won't be getting that cervical extension moment. So if I am looking at reproduction of those symptoms with neck motion, you know, I want to pay attention to, are they putting, are they taking these forces into the thoracic spine or are they localized up in the cervical spine? And, that, and that'll be helpful in differentiating these two individuals. And part of my questioning then becomes, you know, what we call the bias correction. How do I want to make sure that you know, I'm not running into, or I'm not just overlooking other differentials. So Frank or, or Dylan, what, let's say, okay, let's say we think this is a T4 segmental dysfunction. You know, what are all the other differentials that we want to rule out at this point? Well, the, the big ones would be um, making sure it's not a, a visceral, visceral issue mm-hmm. uh, or a notalgia parasthetica issue. Um, the, the visceral ones, it, that's kind of, you know, you get into the questions, start kind of screening, you know, all, all the GI systems and kind of, you know, mm-hmm. ask those, go along those lines. Um, mm-hmm. For Natalja parasthetica, you can ask about burning and, and those kind of parasthetic, parasthetic uh, sensations around the shoulder blade. Mm-hmm. Dylan, what else would you rule out? What other differentials would you rule out as far as your bias correction? So you mentioned neutralgia parasthetica. Yeah, you, you know we're looking at segmental dysfunction. Yeah, you know, I just want to see if the ribs are moving well. You know, I'd, I'd want to find out, make sure it's not anything rib related. If it's specific mm-hmm. to the vertebrae, I know those kind of go hand in hand. At least I yeah. can't together. Right, mm-hmm. you can't make them separate much. Um, yeah, that's really what comes to mind. Making sure we're dealing with biomechanical dysfunction as opposed to something neurological or visceral. Those, those two. Yeah, you know, you have neutralgia parasthetic in there where it would be more paresthesia. It should be more radicular in nature, neurological in nature. You know, yeah, you can check ribs. You can probably kind of lump the ribs in and that's segmental dysfunction, that costotransverse joint, costovertebral, facet joint, 
they're all kind of in the same family in that region. You know, if you looked at a muscular dysfunction, might be one. And, you know, you can get more in kind of like Shirley Sauerman. Do I have something that's just overloaded constantly? Is this a protracted scapula where it's just these muscles are lengthened all the time and just irritable? So do I do a scapular unloading test? Does that change it at all? Does it make it slightly better or does it make it a lot better? So if I'm looking from a muscular standpoint, it might be the other one back there is, can I do an unloading technique to potentially relieve it in that sense? So, and your bias correction is really about what are all the other competing differentials and how do I make myself comfortable with those two tests that it's not one of those. So the more I get those tests come back negative, supporting my initial hypothesis, the stronger I feel about my differential. What I like about it too, is that instead of me being overconfident, and there's a tendency early on in the system to get overconfident. Like I know what it is. I'm just going to focus on my, my first hypothesis, which was positive. And then you stop screening for these other things. Well, then you develop a bias. So this kind of is like a nice barometer for me to just to check myself and make sure that I'm not just kind of anchoring to that, uh, my, my first hypothesis, and that I can screen out these other ones. And I think over time, that helps me be better at recognizing those other ones, instead of just kind of cherry picking it and kind of trying to make everything fit into a segmental dysfunction in the thoracic spine. Any other differentials in this area that anyone can come up with or wants to discuss? Can you just talk about a differential for like thoracic outlet? Ooh, thoracic outlet. That's a good one, Dylan. What's thoracic outlet going to look like? Is that my name you used there? It sure is. Yeah, it's thoracic Dylan outlet. Frank, so it's going to sound like a <laughs> or a duh. <laughs> uh, I'd be looking more for symptoms in the arm rather than the mid back, personally, uh, mm -hmm. for thoracic outlet. You know, I'm looking for mm -hmm. vascular signs or neurological tissue, any, any of those two mm -hmm. systems kind of being at play to rule in thoracic outlet. You know, what is it more likely to be, thoracic, neurological, or vascular? I'd say vascular is the one that, that stood out for people that were true um, thoracic outlet. It, it's, the, it, it's more of the vascular compression, I think, that is causing symptoms opposed to the neural tissue being compressed. Do you agree, Frank? I would disagree. Respectfully, um, it's like Hollywood Squares. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen I, many of them. I would say the yeah. the neural side is would be more common, uh, and vascular is extremely rare and usually a medical emergency. Yeah, it's usually the case is that the vascular, even though you're, you're taught to do the vascular tests, it's much much more rare. You're you're much more likely going to see the the neurological symptoms. I just think the brachial plexus coming up over the first rib. And now think about everything we looked at in rib biomechanics and what we're doing there. And now look at also clavicular biomechanics is that, you know, we have this whole system here, which compresses. And now we have a bunch of techniques or some new things and way to look at it. I think of a way joint biomechanics work. How is the SC joint sitting? What's the clavicle angle? Is it more parallel or does it have a nice upward angle matching the other side? You know, that would create tension on it. You know, do I have an elevated first or second rib that's putting tension on this or a stiff CT junction? So now the system isn't moving as fluidly as it should. So for a thoracic outlet, there's a lot in, the, in this course that you can do for the dynamic thoracic outlet syndrome. So there's a lot to play with in here, but you're, new, you're usually going to think of more neurological. What, it, what, would it, what do you think it would look like, Dylan, if it's neurological? Is it going to be dermatomal, peripheral? What would you think? How would this present? Peripheral? Yeah, usually I would think it's going to be more the whole hand and diffuse. You can get the lower segments, but not really. I think you really what you can see there is that it's usually the whole hand. That's your tell there. So this person comes in. What I'm looking for is, okay, is it your, is it your thumb, middle, index finger? Oh, it's my entire hand. Once they say it's their entire hand, you know, first of all, seven times out of 10, it's not their entire hand, even when they tell you it's their entire hand. Okay, so just always keep that in mind. So as soon as they tell me it's their entire hand, I immediately think they just don't understand the question because they generally don't. And then I'll redefine it for them and check. And then you'll often find it is the middle finger, it is the thumb, it is the index finger. It's typically not the entire hand. If it is the entire hand, then you're looking at something that's probably not a compression at the root or you know at the foramen. You know, there you're looking at a some type of thoracic outlet or peripheral impingement. That's in that system. So I'll look for that. But even when they give me the answer of the entire hand, 
I then go back and tease through it. I just don't blindly accept that as per se the truth because they often don't well discriminate. It's a certain part of their hand. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind as you, as you look at that. How do you go about, te- like, what's your follow-up question then for them? I just had that happen to me. Yeah. I usually kind of, I usually up-tempo, I, up, yeah, I reword it, I up-tempo my, uh, my things. Like, oh, yeah. Like, sometimes I see this and it's like, it's weird. It feels like your entire hand, but it's really just the middle, the middle finger. And some other people, it's just the thumb. So do you think, is it, I feel like it's more than one finger than the other. And I'll touch them a little bit, like on their index finger, say this finger can feel different than your thumb. So I'll touch their, their, their fifth finger and then I'll touch their middle finger. And I'll kind of give them some tactile cues and awareness. And many times it just kind of comes to them like, oh yeah, it is there. You know, and then if it's just the, if it's just the, the index finger, now I'm down to cubital tunnel is most common, you know, versus a, you know, C, C8 over there. So, you know, and I'll just kind of look for that and think, okay, is it then I think, okay, if it's a C8, is it going down the forearm or is it just in the hand? And that'll help me kind of determine it's a, you know, peripheral compression. Yeah. Would you go into like neural testing then, like for the radial median ulnar nerve, if they're having that problem as well of delineating if it's the whole hand or versus a finger or two? I, I, may, I may get into that, yeah. If I think it's going to be a peripheral or, or distal thing, I'll work through them. Yeah, but Dave, I think. I, oh, God. No, go ahead. Um, I talked to you at our last session, I think, about my guy with the elbow mm-hmm. that was descending neurologically. Currently showing up, he's got like a C8 issue, but it's also he's got golfer's elbow, mm-hmm. or, you know, cluster. So we've actually had some good success treating both of those. Yeah. But if you guys have any other um, suggestions, he's also got some pinching up in his upper trap that seems related, but not really. Yeah, you're, you're probably after this weekend, going to manipulate his second rib or his first rib. What you're going to see, you probably also look at this guy's CT junction, you know, with this individual and then you probably have some stress coming from there. And I, I tread lightly there. Maybe once, twice in 15 years, I've seen it where many times you can manipulate or release the thoracic spine and the thoracic spine was taking pressure off the cervical spine and their radiculopathy gets much, much worse. It's rare, but just in the back of your mind, know that occasionally that happens. That's literally like twice in 15 years I've seen it. So I don't, I don't live in fear of it. I'm just aware of it. But for him, he's going to have something going on there. Did you look at the abducted ulna in him by any chance? Sorry, what was that? Did you, did, you, did you look at the ulna to see if the ulna was abducted? Um, he does have an increased Q angle. Uh, he mm-hmm. was a baseball player, so he's just kind of, everything's just kind of externally rotated. Yeah. And um, it, he does have some laxity there as well. Okay, that's what I want to see is if his elbow is abducted. So what I want to do is either Eric or Matt, have them show you how to check and manipulate the abducted ulna. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, we have done some treatment. Um, his T2 is hypomobile, um, especially mm. on into extension on that side. Okay. So something we have been addressing as well as C5 on the opposite side. So okay. he's, he's got a, a few things happening, but. Yeah. Whenever I hear the upper trap pain, then you're thinking, okay, do I have a, do I have an upper rib? And sometimes C2, C3. Because C2, C3, you know, were referred down there as well. So, you know, he probably has a rotated segment. If you feel his neck, he's probably rotated up at his C2, C3. Probably got a, he's probably got another rotation down at C7 or down below, probably where his hypermobile segment, maybe maybe T2, T3. It's probably rotated down there as well, kind of contributing to it. That I definitely check for the abducted ulna. And another thing, if he's having elbow problems like that too. You know, I generally look at the carpal bones, but you'll get into that in the peripheral module. That may be a bit much for Matt to show you, but I would you could ask Matt. Yeah, go over because I'll generally look at the carpal bones and any elbow issue cool. immediately yeah. off the screen carpal bones just in wrist position yeah his uh, favorite form of working out is push-ups so uh, yeah yeah so yeah. lots of so, yeah. lots of other things yeah he needs he needs he needs a new exercise yeah I've got him doing squats now we'll see what happens with his back oh, good good for you yeah but um thank you I'll think about it. I'll send something out to Matt. If not, just remember to grab Matt. For sure. Thanks. 
Wonderful. All right, here's my reach. I'm gonna see if I can share a screen here. To me, I'm so sad I couldn't just bring up my anatomy app and put it up all weekend. So I thought I'd do it today just to get it out of my system. Okay, let me know if this pops up. Can you see complete anatomy on your screen? Nope, not because I can't see mine over here. Oh, can you see it? Oh, that's cool. Yep. Oh, there it is. Good, 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 good. Let's get into it, have some fun. All right, it's the Dylan and Frank show today. Everyone should take some comfort and sit back and relax. Please feel free to help them out however you like. And actually, this, these first questions will be for everybody. Let's think about let's think about this. Let's go to let's go to T4. So let me, let me come up here. T4. So a couple things about T4. We get to T4. We count some ribs here. Two, three, four. The costotransverse joint is more concavo convex in this region. And it's kind of, you can see it, hopefully if it's going in real time, you can see it there, not wonderfully. Think about the transverse process still here coming off a little bit more laterally compared to the lower ribs, let's say seven through 10, where the transverse process is more obliquely oriented posteriorly and the joint is more planar in its glide and that joint that planar glide is going to give you that anterior medial posterior lateral glide and you're going to use that anterior medial posterior lateral glide with really t3 through t10 when you go to the do the weekend courses eric will look at the upper joints have a much more pronounced concavo convex orientation so he's gonna look at it that way but it can be broken down that everything above seven is a little more concavo convex Everything, the ones below that are a bit more planar and posteriorly obliquely oriented. Does that make sense as we look at this? So those upper ribs, because of that concavo convex things, there's more of a spin and a roll. Where in the lower ribs, there's more of a slide and a glide. I mean, you're just making up fucking words. I am, aren't I? Yes. <laughs> so think, I want you to think about this, if you can see my screen, is what this is. I take a deep breath in, Think of this rib on that oblique angle rotating inferior and down. And the upper rib in the anterior portion of the sternum has to go upward. So feel your chest rise as you breathe. And your ribs go up and you exhale and they come back down. You have to have a spin at that costo transverse joint. So four, as you breathe in, has to, the rib has to glide downward and inferior. So it's that posterior roll. As you exhale, the rib glides upward and things. What's cool about this and where you're really gonna learn this well, so if you're confused by today, don't beat yourself up. You can beat me up a little bit, but you're, when you palpate these in during the lab, it'll start to make a lot more sense when you get a tactile feel for it. I think when I put my hands on it and I feel somebody breathe, it's like, oh, there it is, I can see it. And that makes a lot more sense to me when I learn it. But what I want to give you two here, even if it just helps 5%, is just a little bit of an anatomy review, just in how, what happens with these joints and as they do that. So what they'll also talk about too is, I'd say T4, you, you, you inhale, and that rib in the back is going to posteriorly rotate and spin downward. The anterior joint goes upward. But what also happens as you do that, you also feel that joint they'll talk about kind of expanding outward and it almost goes lateral. And as you, in, as you exhale and breathe in, these upper ribs are gonna roll superior and go upward. The anterior rib cage drops down and then it also settles back medial. So there's this, as you inhale, the rib goes posterior and lateral. As you exhale here, the rib glides superior, kind of anterior and medial. And that's what happens. There's this in and out flow of the rib. And when we check rib glides, that's what we're, that's what we're going to check. 
What also happens at the rib, if you think about it, was we're going to look at today, we're going to talk about just T4 rotation. That let's say I turn my head and my shoulders in this direction, we're going to have a rotation. Let's go to the, to the right. So if I rotate to the right at T4, what's going to happen here is, is the ribs act, they rotate kind of like a dominant. So if T4 rotates to the right, because I'm going to look over my right shoulder at the kids in the back of the car. And what's going to happen is at the, at the right costo transverse joint, that rib is going to have a bit of a posterior glide and inferior. And it's going to also, as we do that, there's going to talk about like a, there's a medial translation. We'll talk about that. And the right rib goes posterior and down. The left rib on the right goes anterior and superior. So much like if I, if I were to turn my pelvis to the right, my, and my right anomenic goes posterior, my left one goes anterior, the ribs rotate in the similar plane. So I like to always remember that because when I, it's Monday morning and I'm getting a little lost and I got to rethink about a rib. I think, okay, if I rotate my hips, my nominate goes this way, ribs go the same way. Now I know where I am in space. So that helps me. I hope it helps you and doesn't confuse you. If it confuses you, then of course, please ignore it. So with a right rotation, I have the right rib going medial and posterior. The left rib goes a little bit more anterior and lateral. And the, tr and the rib itself translates to the left. So with this rotation, there is a translation moment ever so slight to the opposite side. So when I rotate to the right, the vertebral body has a translation to the left associated with these rib motions. At that and that's same a pure, point, Dave, that's a pure cervical rotation, correct? And we're not having any kind of thoracic rotation, correct? Oh yeah, we're at, we're at T4, so we have to have a thoracic rotation. So I'm, Think about looking in the back of the car. When I look in the back of the car, my neck rotates, but I'm also going to pull my scapula and I'm going to rotate my thorax. Okay, sounds good. Because I'm in my 40s, so I'm not, going to, I'm not going to get it all with my neck anymore. I got to bring in some help. So as I turn my head, it's just like to think of rotation as also being, you know, because we don't just rotate our thoracic spine. It's usually it's in conjunction with the head or other body motion that's occurring. So this translation is going to occur at this segment. And these are all areas where we can get an articular dysfunction. So my right, let's say my right T4 glides downward or extends on T5 as I go to do this on the right-hand side, the left side flexes. So as I go into rotation, the motion I'm gonna have at these facet joints is, I'm gonna bring up the right, the right facet joint here. Can you see that okay? Okay, that joint extends. The left joint will flex. So on the right hand side, when I when I do this, I have again a posterior roll of the rib. I have extension of this facet joint as I do this. So unfortunately, I'm not a spring chicken. So I rotate to the right to tell the kids to stop doing that. Don't make me pull the car over. Any one of those myriad things that I've heard my parents say a hundred times. And I come back and things aren't right. I come back and something feels tight and spasmy. You know, what I can have here is any one of those articular dysfunctions where I did not return from that position. And from that mechanism, you can think about, it could be, you know, the parent driving the car is a classic one. Think of somebody working at a computer desk who has multiple screens. You know, and maybe a chair that doesn't swivel. You know, they will be prone to some of these articular dysfunctions. And when it's worked, when I find a, a segment that's here, you know, this is going to be my one of my first hypotheses. Is I may find this or I may not find one of these rotations, but this is the biomechanic which could have occurred. I could find that this segment feels like it's rotated to the right and translated, maybe translated to the left. But any one of these segments can be off. And this is what we talk about. If you look at the, it could be a translated segment that you'll talk about with Eric and, and evaluate. It could be that one of these joints in the chain didn't go back to its resting position, whether it was the rib, the costo transverse joint, the, the right facet could be stuck in extension. The left one could be stuck in flexion. 
or the left rib could be stuck in its rolling glide and not return to that position because it went to an end range barrier and got stuck. So with a forced rotation or that gradual like end range rotation, you can many times come up with this. Classic example is someone came in yesterday and what they had was they, they had this in happened at probably about, what do you think, T2 in the shower is a classic one. Washing hair is a classic injury pattern to see, usually a little bit higher up. And what you will find is probably one of these dysfunctions. The rib is the easiest to find, so I always look there first. And that doesn't fix it. And then I get into the thoracic spine, these thoracic joints. Let's see, do I have one of these segments that are off? The segment, I could have one of these four joints involved, or I could have the translation or an anterior subluxation, which can be offset as an articular dysfunction in this rotation. Hate to ask this, but any questions? And if you want to use bad language toward me, please put it in the chat. It saves them so I can look at them later. Oh, I can't see the chat right now. Oops, sorry. Okay, let's think about other things. What I'm gonna go through next is a bit of the anatomy around this region. So let's think about this. And I'll kick this over to Dylan and, and Frank. Let's think about muscular layers. What muscles can be involved in creating a left, I'm sorry, a right rotated segment or left translated segment? I gotta pull up muscle layers individually. Muscle layers, which may do these. Here, let's go at rotatories first. So you're saying a right rotated left translated? Yes. Okay. With this muscle layer, what can create a right rotation, potentially or left translation? So the rotatories on the right? Yeah. I agree. So rotator the rotatories on the right can do that. In your lab, these have a little bit of significance. What, what Eric will probably go over is a bit of a, the facilitated segment model. And in thoracic spine, we'll talk about that the rotatories tend to be hypertonic when this system is dysfunctional. And you may have one of these rotations. And it's because what you'll go over is that there's a model where you can palpate these muscles because their fiber orientation is different than the multifida. The oblique bands, you can kind of, well, if they're hypertonic, stand out you feel this fiber going almost more perpendicular versus longitudinally up the spine. So in the segmental dysfunction model, they'll look at this as this is one area that can be hypertonic. And they'll talk about this deep layer of the rotatories as being one of them. Now, what other muscle layer do we have in here? We have, oh, longissimus coli. So let's see where we have an attachment here. We have attachment to the transverse process. So it looks like this muscle's vector would probably be, what do you say, more, more appropriate in the head? Probably if, what, let's say if this muscle was hypertonic from its attachment point, which side would have to be hypertonic to create a left rotation? So the left one, if it's left rotated. We're, we're, we're right rotated, left translated. You just asked about a left rotation. Did you mean oh. a translation? Yeah, always keep the rotation to the right, no matter when I screw it up. Cool. Uh, so just the correct. right side, I think, would assist with the right rotation. Yeah. So with this one, it would assist with that, but also, yeah, it would. Think about also what, what rotation would occur if where this is attaching. So where do we see this attaching up here? We just sat, we see it attaching with the C2, superiorly long, along those processes. This contracts, yeah, it's gonna rotate the head to the, let's say the, the right one will rotate the head to the, to the right. So it'll probably give you that layer. All right, let's go multifidae. That's where we're heading now. I'm running into a few of them here. Multifidus muscle, which multifidae, if they were hypertonic, would rotate you to the right, left side or right side? Now, again, they don't do a tremendous amount of rotation. They're a stabilizer. I would, would say right again. 
I agree. Mm-hmm. Pretty good. Uh, semi next layer here in here. Let's go. Spine out coli. Get attaching a little bit more superficial this muscle. So you don't see this one as a powerful rotator from its angle attaching to the spinous process and coming back up to the uh, spinous process. It's going to be more of extensor. Yeah. It might be more of a, a right side bender if it's done if it's hypertonic unilaterally. So I'd expect it to side bend and and, it, and the combined motions could go either way. I expect that maybe I would think maybe the right one because you'd have ipsilateral side bend rotation. But again, these can these can vary and it won't be this muscle's dominant motion. But that muscle sits superficial. So other layer we have here is, you know, semispinalis, you know, coli. Interesting orientation, right? From spines process. I'm sorry, transverse process up. Yeah, that would be that extension and rotation. So probably that right side again. Yeah, so what, what it's going to be is if you look at this one, because of its orientation, it's going to create rotation to the opposite side, I believe. Because you have a lateral down here to medial thing. So they'll talk yeah. about this basically pulling it and creating an opposite rotation. So this could be one where you get hypertonic in here you can create an opposite rotation. And again, normally you're not going to see these in isolation, but if you're needling and you're palpating tone in muscles, these can be things that can create these long vectors coming down in here. You will probably see a much greater impact in the thoracic spine with these rotators. But this is just a nice exercise to go through to look at the different muscles, the insertion points, and what is, what is their movement vector going to be? Here we have another one coming from transverse process. It should be longus acapitis if memory serves. Hey, there we go, good. So again, I don't expect this to be much of a thoracic mover just from its orientation, where it is being to be more cervical. But again, anything hypertonic and creating rotation in the upper cervical segments have the ability to kind of rotate the thoracic spine ipsilateral or potentially create a contralateral correction. And again, that's going to be what was called. All right. Getting into some more superficial layers here. Splenius capitis. Again, coming from transverse process up. Again, similar as we talked about earlier, this one here, when unilateral contraction is going to create opposite rotation. So we're looking at the right one here, but if we're looking at right rotation, then the left one on this side would likely create it. So we see a neck and we're finding hypertonicity within this muscle. And we see that we have, okay, maybe C1, C2 is what's rotated to the left, rotated to the right, or we find the thoracic segment is rotated. You know, we can have hypertonicity you know, through this muscle, you know, these muscles creating the rotation. So when you find hypertonicity within any of these muscle groups, what you want to think about is, are there forces up in the cervical spine or in the upper thoracic spine? And, and they can reverberate the, the, the rotation within the articular system can generate the muscle hypertonicity or the muscle hypertonicity can create the joint rotation without an articular restriction. So I like to keep open-minded in that because you take these courses and they're based on manipulation and joint mechanics. And sometimes early on, we lose sight of the fact that not everything is stuck. But if we can identify these rotations and restrictions, identifying those myofascial restrictions or those hypermobility restrictions, it really lends in nicely to selecting the right, the right treatment. I'm gonna come over here and go longissimus thoracis muscle. All right, Dylan, you're up again. Left, which one of these would rotate the thoracic spine to the right. You see the right side? Yeah.
you'll see Eric and I talk about this as well is because because there's attachment down at the pelvis, a pelvic dysfunction can create hypertonicity in longissimus and ilicostalis and create a rotation. So it is possible to find hypertonicity in these muscles that have a pelvic influence in pelvic stability. So your right rotated segment at T8 or T4 could be directly related to the inability to have you know, failed load transfer through the SI joint. And it can be failed load transfer with sitting is a common one we talk about. That you sit, you don't have a stable pelvic base. So these muscles will tone to try and stabilize or provide stability. And now you have this muscle on all the time doing a job it shouldn't do, become hypertonic. So you can kind of trace the hypertonicity generally up to the rib segment of where the rotation occurs. So it's not uncommon to find this. It's not uncommon spot to see muscular fatigue and soreness. It's not uncommon problem to see hypertonicity within this muscular region up in here and create this rotation. Sometimes you'll need to manipulate the rib or get the, get the thoracic segment to correct. Other times you need to kind of travel down and look what's happening at the SI joint, lumbar spine. And seeing if I, if I improve the load transfer through the pelvis, I can change this tone running all the way up to T4, creating this segmental rotation and the segmental dysfunction. Figure this is my GoPro Pro collection. This is gonna be either a really terrible hour or hopefully a very interesting hour. There we go, Ilio Costales, the same. Let's go Ilio Costales. Same thing over here. Look at these rib attachments. So if you think about where are these muscles attached on the rib, they have a bit of an anterior pull vector. So let's say this joint, if we go back to the costo transverse joint, and let's say it's concavo convex, and when I take a deep breath in, it, has, it glides inferior and posterior, or in the bottom joints, the bottom seven, it's that lateral glide, that anterior lateral inferior glide. You can see the action that this rib or these muscles by, by attaching to that inferior border of the rib is gonna pull it downward and inward and create the rotation inferior. Now, if we look at some of the upper cervical muscles when we're in the cervical spine, think about their orientation. Their orientation is slightly different, you know, and what they can do in rotations. So here in these lower segments, because of their lower attachment to the ribs, the ipsilateral muscles tend to create rotation to the same side. When we were in the cervical spine, because of the orientation of these muscle fibers, the contralateral side tended to create, so the left side tended to create the right rotations. Where these lower muscles, because they're coming onto the ribs, tend to create con the, the ipsilateral rotations. Now we're running kind of short on time here. We could easily get into scapular and thoracic influences. And you can kind of make arguments other ways that, that if I have a tight, if my, let's say my, let's say my left, if my left pectoral muscles, pec minor is tight, it's gonna draw my left shoulder forward and create a right rotation. No, oh, no pectoral muscles. Let's get them in there, boom. So tight pectoral muscles, if I draw the shoulder forward, it could generally create a rotation. And it would probably be, say, I would think of that same side because it wouldn't pull the ribs back the other way. If I have a facilitated, let's say serratus anterior. So serratus anterior can have a lot of influence in this region, as well as you know your rhomboids, your, your levator and how the scapular sets. And that can generally kind of indirectly create some of these thoracic rotations based on their tone. So really the, the, what the serratus does can really differ between, is it pulling from a stable base and let's say it's anchored at the uh, medial scapular border. So, okay, if you're pulling on the ribs, it would probably create a contralateral rotation. You know, but if it's kind of drawn and, and protracted, I would, I'm sorry, if it's pulling with a fixed medial border, it would create an ipsilateral rotation pulling on the ribs. If the scapula is protracted, then I might expect a contralateral rotation from this. 
So the good thing is sometimes you don't have to memorize and sense all what rotation will happen here, but you can understand the muscular influences on thoracic position and how these different, different things can come in. You know, you have long vectors coming from latissimus dorsi and how they may pull if we have a restriction there. You know, you have the interdigitation of serratus and here, you know, you see external oblique. So any type of hypertonicity through internal external oblique may generate a rotary force into those upper levels. Let's see how high we're going with this. So not quite making it all the way up there to the fourth rib, it looks like. I think it was five or four. So hypertonicity here in the upper oblique fibers, drawing forward could potentially create a rotation. So in this one, if we're talking internal oblique, it would be a contralateral. I would expect the left side hypertonicity to create the, a, a potential rotary segment. It's pretty far-fetched, it's the upper rib. I necessarily wouldn't expect to see it there. But just understand that there are these muscular influences and vectors. You know, we didn't get into the diaphragm. The diaphragm will influence probably more, you know, lower down, but you'll get segments up there. So if we pick T, let's say we pick T10 to do this exercise, we looked at vectors coming from T10, then the diaphragm and some of those internal things would be a vector that may, that may come into play here in these rotations. So again, the moral of the story is, is that, you know, when you look at these things and you see them, you can start to think about, you know, what, 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 are, what are the vectors that come into play? And you have all these muscular vectors. And if the articular system is restricted, then you can create these muscular vectors between shortening or, adapt, or adapting and segmental dysfunction. If you, you know, if you look at the joints and the joints feel like they're clear to you, then you can have a segment above or below it or look at these muscular vectors. And start thinking, okay, which muscle vector may be giving me this hypertonicity? in the longissimus or iliocostalis and creating this rotation. And you may have to go down or again, you know, in many cases, we looked at what attaches to the occiput and upper cervical spine. You may be looking at these upper muscle groups or maybe a C2 and hypertonicity between, you know, some of these, you know, upper cervical paraspinals, you know, creating this force vector to stimulate this contralateral rotation. So, you know, it's a good anatomy exercise to review because if you understand the anatomy as you go through it, between what are, what are some of the basic joint shapes that we discussed? What are the muscles and the muscle vectors that occur here? There's also pleural vectors in there that we get into and visceral vectors that occur. So you have pull of the diaphragm, you have buccal pharyngeal fascia coming down from the neck, which can create a pulling force into these regions. Pleural irritation, intercostals. If you have a hypertonic intercostals, it's gonna basically side bend you to that side. So right intercostal hypertonicity on that side can create a right rotation. And we can look for what would be causing right intercostal hypertonicity. It may take us back to, a, to the, uh, to the uh, basically the spine or those joints. Sorry, I know it's a little different approach today, but I, I wanted to try and cover some of, some of the anatomy and go over some of the mechanics so that it would just be a little bit more clear you know, or at least create a foundation for when you go into the course with Eric, that you can kind of move a little bit faster when you start to talk about these long vectors and short vectors that occur. Well, I had one question from Isaac. The long thoracic pain dysfunction, how would you differentiate and focus time between pelvic floor dysfunction, postural drivers, such as breastfeeding? Well, that's where it gets, it gets tricky. Um, you know, you have diaphragm and pelvic floor can work together. If you think this is a pelvic floor issue, then one of the easiest ways about ultrasound or being able to do an internal exam is to palpate transverse abdominis if you can, and iliococcygeus, and see if you can feel toning and basically contraction relaxation phases. With iliococcygeus, you may not be able to tell if it's chronically hypertonic or if it's inhibited, but you would be able to see that, okay, I can feel the one side contract and the other side just stays still or stays taut. And again, there's some release techniques that you can do for that if I'm getting a pelvic floor. I may look at, can they stabilize SI joint? If pelvic floor, it, if, if I go and palpate the SI joint and I feel like, okay, the inferior lateral angle is compressed and tight, that's a sign that I could have pelvic floor hypertonicity on that side. If it's nice and loose and I ask them to contract their pelvic floor 
and I don't feel the lower inferior lateral angle tighten up, then I can think, okay, they may have a recruitment issue with that side or the right side of the pelvic floor in that area. And that kind of dictates it. So if I'm looking at a longissimus, the clean longissimus case would be this. I find that they are dysfunctional on the, the right-hand side of the right pelvic floor. And when I test it, they don't, have, they don't have good force closure in the SI joint. When I test them in standing and I look at single leg stance and weight shifting tests, they have failed load transfer through the right SI joint. And I see that the longissimus thoracis on the right is hypertonic in standing and in sitting. Then I know with this person that they're probably trying to use the longissimus and, and an iliocostalis to stabilize SI joint pelvis instead of pelvic floor and proper stabilization. That's, a, that's the clean case that I can kind of uh, talk about. And Eric, Eric likes this case. It's usually a case he'll present in this one. So he'll probably go over that case scenario with you as well, which is kind of cool. Good. Okay. Hey, hope this was helpful today in this format. And I'm going to have Eric also kind of ask you just to see how these formats have been going. You know, we're always open to your feedback and what is helpful in the formats. We used a couple of different ones. And if you like the variety of going over some didactic material, and then also can just going over some cases, we'll continue that. So just to redefine it, we want to make sure we get good value out of it, but also to make sure that we cover a good bit of the didactic content. So it's less that we have to do, we can spend more time in lab or during the on-sites. Cool, and if you have no questions, we'll call it a day. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. No problem. It's okay, Jen, I love salty language. Oh my God, Dave, I am so... <laughs> no way, I love salty language. Oh, so sorry. Oh, I feel, like, uh, I, feel like I'm just, I feel like I'm being crushed by political correctness. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know my microphone was on and no, I got no. back from Mexico and I've been drinking for like oh, seven days. Oh yeah, you have, you have, to, you have to cuss if you're in Mexico. <laughs> oh, thank you, I, 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 will, I will be better. No, what I want you to do is email me Sunday or Monday and let me know how you feel with this, okay? If you have any specific questions or anything that's unanswered, but don't be afraid to ask questions there too. Yeah, no, I'm just, um, I think it's just like you had said, the, like the biomechanics is, it's a lot. I oh my God. Oh, I have to read them all the time. I don't, you know, these don't, these don't roll off my tongue. No. I, I, I have yeah. to memorize these myself. Yeah. I mean, I have to go back and reread them and do them and then, okay, which way is it? So don't beat yourself up over not having these things memorized. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, and it's not an area that I've ever, mm -hmm. like, yeah. this is like a first time. So. Oh, this will be fun. This is yeah. again, and, and never judge yourself by this course. Mm -hmm. Judge yourself at module eight. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, that's Thanks. the cool thing about it is it's not like, oh, at the end of this course, you have to have it all. I care about where you are at the end, not anywhere in the middle. Okay. Thanks, Dave. All right. Be good.